Welcome to What the World Needs is Jesus Broadcast. Excited to be here today. Excited to be uh, getting to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. We got a few announcements here today. Pentecostal Power Ministries is holding VBS. Amen. Vacation Bible School. Man, I love Vacation Bible School. When I was a kid, I loved it. Amen. It's going to be July the 12th through the 16th. All school-age kids are welcome. Uh, the theme is Rocky Railway. Uh, boy, I tell you what, Vacation Bible School is a wonderful, wonderful thing for kids, amen, to come and learn about Jesus. Uh, they'll have crafts, outside activities, if the weather's permitting, snacks, and uh, they'll just be doing a lot of different things with the kids. And uh, uh, most importantly, they'll be having a class for each, uh, each child to to learn a little bit about Jesus, amen. They'll have teachers teaching them a little bit about Jesus, amen. The one that can save them, the one that can keep them, the one that can hold them, amen, whenever they need whenever they need something that uh, somebody else can't give them. Sometimes we need something from the Lord that nobody else can give us, amen. Uh, and you, But you got to know Jesus before you can get that, amen. So uh, 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 we need to teach our children about Jesus, amen, to to get to know him, amen. Glory be to God. Today on our broadcast, we're going to have Brother Tommy Blevins, amen. He's going to be preaching uh, the title of his message is No Private Interpretation, amen. There's no private interpretation, glory to God. He's going to explain it. He's going to let you know all about that, amen. He's going to start in the book of 2 Peter uh, 1 and verse 19 and 20. Amen. And then afterwards, we're going to have a song from uh, Sister Debbie Collins, the Old Church Choir. Boy, that's a good song. Glory be to God. If you would, please subscribe, like, and click the bell to turn on your notifications on YouTube. Follow, like, and share us on Facebook. And also check us out on Instagram for some inspirational posts. Now sit back and enjoy the video. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back down here with family and stuff this weekend, yeah. this Memorial Day weekend. Hope you're having a good holiday. Hope all your travels have been safe. We're going to preach a little bit out of the Word here today. It's probably something you may have never heard preached. But we're going to address a lot of things, and I'm going to answer a question that's been asked of me many times over the past 30 years in being in ministry by different people, different denominations and everything. And we're going to go through the Word and show you some stuff from Genesis to Revelations and why things are the way they are in the body of Christ today. So while you're going to get your books, I'm going to put up a disclaimer here for what the world needs is Jesus. If this sermon makes you mad, ill, or whatever, gets under your skin and you go to Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and you want to post an angry, trashy message, uh, what the world needs is Jesus has a secret weapon. It's called a trash can. And it's going to go in it. We're not even going to bother to respond to you or make a comment about it. So if you don't agree with this today, that's your problem. We're up here to obey the Holy Spirit and to set some people free today that's under traditional religious persecution. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to obey God today and let Him have His way. So while you're going to get your Bible, that's what it is. And that's the way it's going to work. It's simply a platform that all kinds of ministers come to and use as an outlet to preach the gospel, no matter what denomination or faith or whatever it is. This is simply a, what the world needs is Jesus is an outlet for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. They're not responsible for what's preached. They're not responsible for the preachers that preach it. So that's your disclaimer today for what the world needs is Jesus. Now, if you're back with your Bible... We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. And this is what it says. For we also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed <laughs> as unto a light that shineth into a dark place until the day star dawns and the day star, or excuse me, until the day dawn and the day star arises in your heart. Verse 20, knowing this first, 
that no prophecy of Scripture is, uh, is of any private interpretation. And what he's talking about here in the prophecy of Scripture, he's talking about the revelation of the Holy Spirit. See, God de designed every individual that's ever been on this earth for His purpose and His glory, and we're all unique and all different. Amen. And what I have learned over the years that God deals with men according to their calling, their gifts, and their purpose. If any man stands before you and tells you, I know everything in the Word of God that there is to know, that man is nothing but the liar, and the truth is not in him. Because God does not and cannot reveal everything about himself to one man. We can't handle it. Our noodle isn't big enough. You know, we just can't handle it. He says in his words, his ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are much higher than our ways. And we cannot, as an, in our little infinite human carnal mind, handle all that. We just get one little bit of inkling of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Brother Rick, and just fall all to pieces. You know, we just can't handle it in this, in this flesh that we're housed in. Our spirit man can handle it, but we as individuals cannot handle the fullness of God. We have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but He don't release it to us at all times. And the question that I've been asked over the years I've had several men, pastors, different men of God come to me and say, Brother Tom, why is there so much division in the body of Christ? Why are there so many people that, men, that believe so many different ways? And I can tell you today, there's a lot of you sitting out there in the church that you attend, and you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and you have tried to tell your testimony and your encounter to a lot of people in that church or in the body of the Christ, and they've looked at you and said, I don't believe that. If God would do that to you, He would have done it through me first because I'm closer to God than you are. You need to sit down and shut up. You're an apostate. You're of a different faith. You need just to be quiet because that's not a God thing. Let me tell you something. God is way above what you are or what your neighbors think or what the people on the pew sitting beside you may do. He gives every man and every woman a different testimony for His glory, and the way He chooses to do it is for His business and His purpose. So what we're going to do today, and I just love it when God confirms a message, and God and the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me with this about three months now. And I knew it was for here, and I knew it was to be put on here. And I come down here and got to talking to Brother Rick today, and he was telling me things and, and all that. And he didn't know it, but at that time, he was just confirming what God had sent me down here to put on air concerning what we're just talking about. Now, the first thing we're going to do, and I'm not going to do it, we're going to tear this Bible up called Genesis to Revelation. So the first thing we're going to do, figuratively speaking, and this is what comes down through denominational teaching, traditions of men, all these things, why there are so many different religions in the world today concerning Christians. If you go over to Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning God created. Well, you have a teaching that's flowing throughout the church and has through for the years that people actually in the body of Christ deny the actual seven-day creation. They buy into man's teaching of evolution, so they deny creation in Genesis. All right, the next thing you do, you have a gap theory that's thrown in there that a lot of people believe in. You may believe in it. I don't know. I don't care. I'm just telling you what the Holy Spirit told me. That says God created the world, and He was incapable of uh, creating a perfect world, so He had to back up and start again. So we throw the gap in there. Then we jump on up to Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve is sin, and you have people in the body of Christ today that deny that all mankind came out of two people. So, you know, what do we do with that? Not my problem. Because the Holy Ghost will deal with you if you are His and bear His Spirit within you, wherever it may be. And we're going to do this kind of fast for time's sake. So we're going to jump on up to the flood. Have people in the body of Christ today that deny that there was a global, global flood. That they deny that God, or excuse me, Noah couldn't got all those people and all those animals on the ark. Well, he did. Yeah. If you believe the Bible, then you've got to believe it wholly, not partially. Amen. 
Yeah. So we've had doctrines upon top of doctrines that was created by carnal-minded men not being led of the Spirit or misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the Word of God that has started traditional teaching, and it's flourished throughout the last 2,000 years. So to jump on up to the New Testament, we get up there and we have people that says, well, you know, that Old Testament, that was just an example. And really all it's good for is we take it to Bible school or we take it to Sunday school and we teach our children these fairy tale examples. So we really don't believe that the Old Testament is the inspired Word of God. So we'll just take this whole entire book of the Old Testament and rip it out and throw it in the trash and say we don't believe it. All right? But you know that always, they don't believe the Old Testament, but there's one thing, one thing that God gave Moses back in Exodus that they'll keep out of that Old Testament. They'll throw the whole thing away, but we'll keep this one thing, and that one thing is the Ten Commandments. And we'll use those Ten Commandments to condemn the sinner, condemn those that have sin in their fleshly dwelling body in the body of Christ. We'll either take that and condemn them or we cast them out. But, you know, that's in the Old Testament. We're not supposed to be using the Old Testament according to a lot of Christian teaching and Christian doctrine in different denominations. Uh, you know, Jesus preached out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did you catch that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wasn't written at the time of Christ. Christ used the Old Testament. Christ preached himself. Christ preached redemption. Christ preached all the works of the gifts and all this out of the Old Testament. Every time he come before the scribes and Pharisees and they say that we say this, he said, well, it is written, and he would take them back to the actual truth of what was written in the Old Testament that they had misinterpreted all these years. And that's what Peter's saying over here in verse 19. He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy because we have the evidence of Jesus Christ and we have the revelation of the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand Christ's teaching until the day of Pentecost when the, they were infilled with the Holy Spirit. We'll get on into that in a minute. So we just tore out the whole entire Old Testament and threw it away. So we come on up to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We actually have Christian churches that say, well, you know, we really don't need Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John because it was written strictly to the Jews. Okay, that sounds really good, but it's absolutely untrue. It was written to the body of believers that was penned by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you take the three, or four Gospels out and you tear that out of your Bible and throw it away, you just found out that you threw away all of your redemptive plan. You just threw the history, the virgin birth, the life of Christ, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection, the very foundation of your redemption, you just tore it out and threw it in a trash can. Yeah. And a lot of that has been taught by carnal-minded people that didn't have the Spirit of God that's been handed down through traditional man teachings of the flesh for years. So what are you going to believe? Oh, well, we're going to flip on over to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to come on in here because right there we have the nomination say, okay, that, that was where the church was born at. Acts chapter 2, verse 2. You can't show me the church anywhere except right here. Well, you need to know where to look and you need to be led of the Spirit because you can see the church everywhere, all the way back. The church simply means those that are called apart, out, those that are set apart, the chosen one, the redeemed one. About any definition you want to put there for redemption, that's who he's talking about, those that were set apart, 
But we've took that C-H-U-R-C-H and we've made this great doctrine and built buildings and all this stuff and we set up laws and governments and all this stuff to control these churches and all this stuff. And I know what I'm talking about because if you go to my house and you go into my house and open my filing cabinet, you will find a whole section in that top drawer that's nothing but bylaws, tenets of faith, all these things, missionary statements, everything, of many different denominations that I went through over the years and studied and actually have written some of them myself. And it's nothing but for the controlling, according to government standards, of the C-H-U-R-C-H people. Everything. I file 501 C's. I've helped set up corporations. And all of it is all about the controlling of the body of Christ according to political standards that have been handed down. About 28, almost 29 years ago, the Holy Spirit sent me into a Bible study, and I walked into that Bible study being the most controversial person in that Bible study. And I walked in there, and I walked in right in in Acts chapter 2, verse 2. Excuse me. Yeah, verse 2. I walked in there. And all the people that were sitting around in there, there were 21 people in there besides me. Deacons, preachers, common lay people. And they read Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And speaking of tongues, when the Holy Spirit come in like a mighty rushing wind, the tongues of fire set up on the heads of men, and they begin to speak in unknown tongues. And they, everyone, turned and looked at me and said, what do you think about that? Well, they really didn't know what I thought about that. They didn't really want to know what I thought about that because, see, I went crazy once in my life. I read the book of Acts. And I said, God, if this is true and this is really for me today, then you show this to me today. Well, he still hadn't stopped showing me 30 years later. I'm still learning of what the book of Acts is all about. So we say, okay, we established the church of that, but, 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 Brother Tom, we really don't want to believe all that stuff about speaking in tongues. We really don't want to believe all that gift stuff, but we'll keep, you know, a part of it. Uh, we'll receive the Holy Ghost, but we won't accept the mighty rushing wind. And we won't accept the speaking in tongues and none of that stuff. So we'll just tear the first section of chapter 2 of the book of Acts out. And then we go on and read all these miracles that was done by the, the apostles and all this stuff that's in the book of Acts and the prophecies and stuff in the book of Acts. And we really say, well, you know, that's not for us today. That was just for the early church. So we'll just tear the whole book of Acts out of our Bible along with the rest of it and we'll throw it in the trash can. And we wonder why that so many questions arise in the church. Well, let's just jump on up a little bit farther here and, let, and let's just go up to um, let's just go up to 2 Corinthians or the books of Corinthians. Talk about that a little bit. Paul says in there he's ex. He's exhorting the church. He's actually, the two letters to Corinth is a rebuke to the church because the church in Corinth has done just about like what a whole lot of the churches in America and the world has done today. We come together to feast and party and to discuss traditional things and pat one another on the back and we have ceased to do the works that Paul was rebuking them for to do because they were taking up the feast days, the festivals, and they let people come in unaware and introduce Judaism and stuff at Corinth. And he's rebuking them, telling them, this is not what the church is all about. You're going back under the church of the law, which Jesus said to go back under that, under circumcision and all that was the sin. And Paul is actually rebuking them, and he goes on to explain how we are a unique body of Christ, individuals set together to work together with Christ being the head. Oh, boy, we're getting awful tough there. Then we got the fivefold ministry, you know, prophets, apostles, teachers, pastors, all this in there. So we'll tear all, all that stuff out because we don't want to believe all the other stuff. And we'll, we'll just keep the pastor and the teacher. And then we'll throw in an evangelist. 
Well, we have people in the church today that are actually evangelists that have collected up a little following as they go out to preach the gospel and they are standing in the pulpit as pastors out of the order of God as an evangelist and they preach and preach and nobody answers the altar call because all the people that are sitting there in front of them standing there in front of them is already saved. So what do they do? They turn to condemnation. They go back to the Old Testament, bring up the Ten Commandments and use it to condemn the very people that are sitting there in front of them. And we wonder why our churches don't grow. Because we've got to have evangelists standing in the office of a pastor rebuilding, relaying the foundation of salvation over and over and over and over and over again. And we never go on to move off of the foundation, like Paul says, to grow up in Christ and eat of the meat of the Word. Hmm, boy, it's getting tough. <laughs> it's getting hard to chew. So we'll just tire First and Second Corinthians out and we'll throw that in the garbage can with the rest of it. Oh, well, let's go on up to Thessalonians. You know, there's that thing in Thessalonians called the rapture, but it's really not called the rapture. It's called the catching away of the saints. And we've got all this discussion of what do you believe about the rapture? Paul tells us when he quotes that, he says, use this to encourage the body of Christ. Oh, well, we have all this doctrine come in. Well, you believe in, 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 in the pre-tribulation rapture. Well, well, do you believe in the mid-tribulation rapture? Well, do you believe in the post-tribulation rapture? Well, I had a good friend of mine that was a young Christian, an old rock-playing hippie, long hair, got saved. Who had thought it? God saved that dude. I mean, I wouldn't have saved that dude, you know. <laughs> He had hair down to his waist, blonde hair even, you know, had some tattoos. And, uh -oh. oh, yeah, he was. He played rock music and did drugs and all that stuff. That man was not worth saving, you know, if you go by the opinion of the church. But God up and saved that rascal. Yeah, you creep him down, come on. And he become a baby in Christ. Well, we worked in construction together, and I was all the time going on the jobs where he was at. And he got on this thing somehow. I don't know how he got on it. But every time I would go on a job site, he would, I wouldn't be there five minutes till he would bring up the rapture. What do you think about the rapture? And this went on and went on, and I got so disgusted that I actually hated to go to the job site he was on. Because I knew I wasn't going to be there five minutes till we were going to get into this discussion about the rapture. And one day I was heading to his job site and I was just praying, you know, in the truck. God, I don't want to go up here. God, you know what you're going to go. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Uh, you know, it's going to start all over. I'm sick of hearing about it. You know, I don't want to discuss it. And I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, what does it matter? And in my great hillbilly mind, I'm like, huh? What do you mean? He said, what does it matter? Where I am, the word says, there you will be also. I said, well, that makes pretty good sense. So I went on up there, and I was on a job, sure enough. Hadn't been there 10 minutes. Here he comes. What do you think about the rapture? And he goes on out this big spill and all that stuff. And I looked straight at him, and I said, what does it matter? He looked at me real funny, and I said, the word says, where Christ is, whether it's through the rapture, pre, post, mid, tribulation, all that, whatever, and second coming, or whatever, he says, wherever I am, there you will be also. What does it matter? He looked at me with this strange look, and he said, you know, you're right. We never had that conversation again. You know, there's a lot of saints out there today that are feet, according to Paul in Corinthians. And the feet are kicking the butt because they won't act like a foot. And we have hands out there that don't act like a butt or don't act like a foot, but they got their hands wrapped around the neck of the church that are choking the life out of the pastors that are actually pastors out there trying to tell them what to preach and how to follow the Spirit so the whole body is out of order and dead. All because of carnal-minded sayings and arguments that have been handed down through generation and generation, Christians after Christians, all over this. So, okay, let's just do a little more scripture ripping here. 
Yeah, that's a pretty good one there. We'll just throw Corinthians, or not Corinthians, but there's the first Thessalonians. We'll throw them in the, in the Bible too. Well, let's just go up to Peter here where we're at. And Peter's saying we have a more sure word of Christ. What he has, more sure word of prophecy, what he's talking about is the witness of Christ. He goes on down 21 and says that in old days the prophecy came by men as interpreted by men as given to them by God in the old days. And he's saying right here in this, we have a more sure word of prophecy because the interpretation or revelation of the Holy Spirit gives each and every man according to his will. If you go back to some of those books that we tore out, that's what he says. He said, I give gifts unto men as liberal as I please. You know, so God's dealing with you in a great different uh, situation according to your calling, according to your gifts, and according to your purpose of God here on this earth for His glory. So He's not going to deal with you as an evangelist the same way He will as a pastor. He's not going to deal with you as a deacon the same way He does an evangelist. He's not going to deal with you as a teacher the same way He does a prophet. Because he's going to use you according to his will and he's going to give his revelation to you according to his purpose and you're not going to get the whole thing. You may think you have the whole thing, but you don't have the whole thing. The more I learn about the scripture, the stupider I realize I am. Because everything I find, I think I've got something figured out. He said, you ever look at this? Well, that is. You know, uh, you just scan the surface. You know, there's depth in this word. You need... You, you need to pull back another layer and, and listen to what I'm telling you. I was telling Brother Rick about some things I went through here a couple of years ago. I was under attack in my finances, mentally, spiritually, physically, and everything else. And I kept hearing what the Spirit was saying to me, and I couldn't get no relief. I wound up in a fetal position, cramped up in my recliner, uh, with a throwing up in the white porcelain bowl. And I'm sitting there, and, and he's trying to get this revelation to me, and I finally just said, I ain't having this. I ain't accepting this. You are not putting on this on me, devil. I've been healed. I've been delivered, and I'm not accepting this. Because the promises of God are sure and true to me as a believer. I made that statement about 15 minutes later. I had peace of mind. Check coming to the mail the next day. Everything was fine and perfect. I didn't have no kidney stone. I wasn't tossing my cookies anymore. I was perfectly fine. And the Word of God came to me and gave me a revelation of what the Holy Spirit was saying in my spirit. And I got the understanding of that. But I had to go through all that test of all that junk in order for Him to get my attention to tell me what He was trying to take me deeper in understanding so I can give it to you. Yeah. I used to tell people all the time, when the only reason I'm up here teaching or I'm up here preaching, I got to go through it just before I give it to you. So we're tearing up this Bible today that's been inserted of doctrines that are born of carnal-minded men according to their carnal understanding or their misinterpretation of the Spirit. Well, while we're just tearing everything out, that's long as we're gone, let's just tear Peter out here too because Peter says stuff like, you know, the Holy Spirit make groanings and intercession for you. Uh, you know, Peter went to Cornelius' house and found out that the Gentiles were supposed to speak in tongues just like the Jews, uh, all this stuff. You know, Paul and Peter had some words. Peter was trying to put circumcision back in the church, and Paul rebuked him, said, you can't do that. Right. Peter said, oh, well, you know, some of Paul's sayings are hard. We need to get a hold of some hard sayings in these last days of the revelation of the Spirit because the time and the day that we are living in as a generation and our children are li living in as a generation, we need to get to the meat of this thing. Yeah. We need to get down to the truth and get the traditions of man thrown away and in the garbage can where they belong and restore the whole word yeah. into the body of the Christ so we can learn to live by it. And that's why the power has gone out of the body of Christ because there's so much confusion and so many people in the body of Christ are out of order right. according to their callings and gifts. Peter was one of them at that time, but he took his rebuke from Paul and he straightened up and here we have First and Second Peter and he says that the Holy Spirit makes groanings and intercessions in there that were for us that we can't even utter. So, you know, Peter wasn't perfect, so there goes First and Second Peter in the trash. And you know, back over there in Acts that we done tore out and throw it in the trash, oh, there's denomination that ain't nothing but Followers of Paul. Paul plainly said, Don't be a follower of me. Don't be a follower of Apollos. 
Don't be a follower of disciples, but be a follower alone of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Yeshua, the anointed one, yeah. Jesus Christ. Don't follow me because I'm not perfect. Well, you know, there was this other disciple named Barnabas. Paul kind of had a little journey going on there, and him and Barnabas walked together a lot. And one day he had to go to the Gentiles, and he wanted Barnabas to go with him. You know, Barnabas refused, Brother Rick, to go preach to the Gentiles. And Paul counted Barnabas unworthy to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and preach the gospel for a long time because of that right there. But Paul finally realized that Barnabas wasn't an apostle to the Gentiles. He was. Right. So he came back and reestablished Barnabas as an apostle and accepted him back in as one of the chosen few. So Paul was not perfect if you're a Paul follower right. because Paul said, I die daily Amen. to my flesh. The things that I should do, I don't do. The things that I would do, I don't do. The things I wouldn't do, those things I do. I have a thorn in my flesh that Satan buffets me with daily and I prayed to God to take me to take it away and God said, in your weakness, my grace is sufficient. If you're on this planet as a Christian and you say you don't commit a sin, you're a liar. Because as long as you're in this flash house, you will sin. The problem, the thing you need to know is you're forgiven. You're not condemned, you're forgiven. It's paid for, it's done with, it's cast as far as the east is from the west. So if you made some of these mistakes that I'm talking to here, if you made some of these mistakes that you've been persecuted for that I'm talking about here, simply repent. Amen. Just repent and say, refresh me and renew me and restore me and show me and teach me. I don't need this religious. I need the truth of the gospel. Bible study man I've been in with now for 28 years, he told me the first time I went down there, all I want to know is the truth. And I want to look at him and say, you can't handle the truth. All you want to know is what your doctrine says. You can't handle the truth. But I thanks God a Holy Ghost zipper on my lips kept my mouth shut. And today he's been faithful in that Bible study and learned and learned and learned and come to find out he was having all these religious arguments and he had never read his Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He had taught Sunday school. He had been a deacon. He had been every part in the church and all this stuff. And yet he was an elder in the church. And he had never, never read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Verse by verse, precept upon precept, line upon line. He had never done it. How do you establish yourself as an elder if you don't know what you're talking about? And that's what we have a lot of in the body. Oh, well, let's just go and rip out some more Bible. Let's go to James. And we really tire out the book of Hebrews, except it's got that faith chapter in it that goes all the way back to Adam. And then we, we, we really tire it out, but it's got the faith thing in it, so we'll keep that one. We'll hold on to that. It's not too tough on us, but it, it gives it away right there in the title. If you, if you, if you believe that the four Gospels were written to the Jew. What does Hebrew mean? It was written to the Hebrews. It was written to the Jews. But we'll accept Hebrews. It's all right because of the faith thing. We've got to have the faith thing. So we'll do Hebrews. But now we'll go over to James. And there's a lot of churches that don't even recognize the book of James as being anointed and shouldn't even be in the canon. They say it's not in there. It's, it's not anointed. Uh, he, he, they go right over to that one verse where he says, you show me your faith and I'll show you my works. And if you show me your works, I'll show you my faith. And, and they say, well, he's putting you back under works and, and your salvation was faith alone. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying if you're born again of the Spirit and you're following your example, Jesus Christ, you will have both evidence in your testimony. You will declare your faith and back it up by the works that Christ did. And then we jump over there and he gets on that little thing and says it's an unbridled thing and out of it comes both blessings and cursings. It ought not to be so. It's called the mouth. 
and the tongue. Oh, I, I did a preaching one time on tongue and the words that we use, and I thought I was going to be stoned. But it's the truth. And we take James and we tear him up and throw him in the trash because, you know, it, it, it gets down where I live at. It gets down to what I'm doing, what I'm believing, what I'm saying, what I'm taking, what I'm carrying on. It gets down to the point that I should be Christ-like and the reason I'm not because I run my mouth too much and I sit on my butt and do nothing, but I declare great works of faith. One thing I've learned about walking with Christ, he says he's raising up a testimony in you. Yeah. I have yet to have a testimony without a test. Wish it were so. But every time I've, he adds to my testimony, it's because I've just came through a test, and I had to walk by faith and work it out to see the evidence of my faith that got me through the test. A lot of things I wish I had never been tested in, but I, praise God, he's faithful to his word. He has brought me through this. Yeah. He brought me through the fire, and I will come to know more that he was the fourth man in the fire uh -huh. that led me and was there with me all the time, even though I didn't understand what was going on and why am I going through this mess. But I come out on the other side saying, you know what? Jesus is faithful yeah. to his people with revelation, miracles abounding. All his promises are sure and true. Well, let's jump over here to this last book. This big revelation over here in the very back of the book. You know, right here. Right here, revelation. You know, this, that's it. Revelation. I have had pastors of large churches come up to me and say, Brother Tom, what do you think about Revelation? I said, well, you know, it's the inspired Word of God. It's in the Bible. You know, I think we should be reading it, and I think we should be understanding it, and, and, and I think we should know what it's talking about. And they'll tell me, I won't preach Revelation. I won't teach Revelation because I'll just be truthful with you. I don't understand Revelation, and Revelation scare me to death. Mm. Well, you forgot to read the first verse of Revelation chapter 1 that says, <laughs> Revelation chapter 1 that says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, talking about John, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. You know, if you would get a hold of that very first verse right there in Revelation you would learn that the book of Revelations is not about an apocalypse. The root, root book of Revelations is not about all the destruction of the sin and the sinners in the world, but the truth of the Revelation is it's about the revealing of the things of Christ. It's about the revealing of the things of God coming upon this earth. As Brother Rick and I was talking here this evening, I have seen things in the last two years speed up and abound. Things that I said 30 years ago that I didn't ever think would come to pass happened in my county. In front of me, it's just like they exploded. And I never really, th I preached it, but I never really, you know, I wasn't that sure. I'd ever seen any of it come to pass. But things right here in America has changed so fast in the past two years under this COVID thing that I've seen miracle after miracle after miracle and just walked around with my mouth open in total amazement. I had a nephew <clears throat> that got saved and thought he was a theologist, and he'd been saved about two months. And the first place he want, went, and one of the tricks of the enemy is to take a new Christian that don't know anything about the Gospels of Jesus Christ that have never read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, which we've done, throw it in the trash. 
and they've never read anything else in the Bible except they're saved and redeemed and Christ was crucified on the cross, he'll take them out of Matthew and he'll send them straight to Revelation. And then they get to reading Revelation about all the bowls and the vials and all the destruction and all the one-third of the earth and the ocean and the seas casting up and giving up their dead and there's that white horse. Daggone that white horse. He come barging in my house one day and he said, Well, Tom, you're the preacher. What do you think about that white horse and revelations? I said, Which one? Oh, you mean there's more than one? I said, You need to go back home and read your Bible before you just get into the debate over revelations you don't know anything about. But that's the way we are as carnal minded babies in Christ. You know, we'll jump right in over our head because we think we have got it all. Been there, done that, sunk in that puddle. And that's why that today we have so much confusion in the body of Christ about who believes what and who is supposed to be where because, because of all the carnal doctrines and misunderstandings of men and their own private interpretations of Scripture through the past 2,000 years that we are a mess. And I'm not telling you this today to condemn you because you're in some denomination that believes this stuff, you know, that's been taught this stuff. But the point of it is, you haven't bothered to study the Word of God. You haven't bothered to have a walking, living relationship with Jesus Christ. You have put your dependence on a man standing where I am standing today, giving you his interpretation of what the Scripture says, and you make your own interpretation led by or not the Holy Spirit to arrive to where you are. Paul says, don't go lay again the foundations of your salvation, but build on, on them and go into the meat of the word, the truth of the gospel for yourself. Ouch, boy, this has been rough. We just trash can the whole Bible. So if we trash can the whole Bible, what are we basing on our our revelation knowledge on if we destroy the entire Word of God. You know, if we take these 66 books and tire all of them out but four or five, you know, we can go to Romans and read all day long. Romans is a good book. But then there's confusion in Romans. You go to Romans chapter 5 and you start reading down in the last verse of chapter 5 and it talks about all men falling by one man and all being, being, being redeemed by another man. And then right in the middle of that, he sticks that word many. Ow. One verse he uses all, and he steps down there just right in the middle of all that and said, many were made sinners by one man, and many were made righteous by one man, and all and many make my effort. But when you get in there and understand the revelation of that, you know exactly who he's talking about. You throw some other stuff in there with it scripture that you need to know and I'm not going to get into it and I'm not going to try to explain it because I don't want to cause confusion. But he says in the last days sin will abound. And boy have we been seeing sin abound in America for the last 20 years and this last two years it's literally exploded. We've had laws and stuff passed that I thought we would never ever see passed in the United States concerning religion. And they're still on the books being passed today. Yep. Things that are being taught in our schools. I preached in graduation service Thursday night, and I literally didn't preach to the graduates of the class. I preached to the parents of the, the student, parents of the students that are coming into school and enrolled in enrolled into Christian school, and preached the charge of them that they need to raise their children and they need to live a Christian lifestyle. It's not up to a Christian school to produce their Christian children and raise them for them. It's them to live out Christ in front of their children, and we're a tool to help them raise them in Christ and have the knowledge of Christ and educate them into a world that they need to be in, that they don't follow the crowd, they don't follow the social media multitudes, but they are thinkers for themselves, examining and living by the Word of God with the understanding of the Holy Spirit, indwelling with them then and leading them into the light as we was back over in Peter, it's shining into the darkness. The day star needs to dawn in your heart and clear out some of this confusion. So if you're sitting there in a church and you're being persecuted 
by somebody in that church or the pastor from the pew and all this stuff, you need to have your revelation. If you've had a revelation by the Holy Spirit that you know is of the Holy Spirit, then you need to get out from under the pew and out from under the people's feet to stand on your head and declare your witness for Jesus Christ. You'll be set free. I guarantee you you'll be set free. I've had people abandon me left and right because I, you know, I went crazy that day. I went crazy that night at 2 o'clock in the morning. Something happened to me. I put on the mind of Christ. I lost mine. Didn't have much to start with, you know, but when I pulled on the mind of Christ and started seeing things through Christ's eyes by the leading of the Holy Spirit, I lost, I lost family members. I lost everything else. I found myself alone with basically nobody but me and God and the very short members of my family. So I was telling Rick today, my whole family on the other side abandoned me totally. The only family I really had was those Christians that were weird, like me, on my wife's side. You know, that was that become my family because yeah, they, they were just a little bit nuts. Yeah. Because his older brother, a drug addict, drug addict, one attempted murder and everything else, turned him into a Pentecostal preacher. Ooh, come on. You know, yeah. so weirdness runs on her side. So I, I can inch over here to Brother Rick and I can inch over here to Jackie and yeah, Susie yeah, because, you know, they're just a little bit weird. <laughs> so I pretty well fit right in, you know, in, yeah, in this clique. And, and then I've got off down here in Alabama and I met some people over in Georgia and, they're weird too. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just all you can say. When it comes to Jesus Christ, they a bunch of us just weird. But we get in this scripture, we get in our prayer closets, and we search and we hunt and we Amen. seek God. If you seek you first the kingdom of heaven, Amen. all these things will be added unto you. We just had church up there at the shop trying to go try and get my car out. Amen. You know, yeah. We couldn't quit preaching long enough to change the battery. <laughs> But that's what it is to be Christ-like. That's yeah. what it is to be a Christian. That's what it is to be freed from religion that's got you in bondage. Step out, come out. We have everything else coming out of the closet. You're a Christian, get the heck out of the closet. Get in this Word and restore the full Word of God in your life and in your family and in your church. We have evangelists and everything else out of order in the body of Christ. You need to be a pastor, and you need to put some deacons and elders and board members under your feet because they're choking the life out of the vision and strangling the congregation. You need to get some backbone and Holy Ghost boldness and put your foot on somebody's head and take your place with a vision for that church and for that body and lead that ministry to where God is leading you to lead that ministry. I had a good friend of mine. Went to his church and it was one of the strictest Baptist churches where I live at. Known for its strictness over the years. Well, the pastor got healed of cancer. He lost his mind. I right there in front of God and everybody. And he started loosening the reins of religion on his church. Well, it had been tradition that the church members showed up about 7.15, 7.30. You know, they were out and gone by 8, 8.15. One day the Holy Ghost broke out in that place. The Holy Ghost just broke right out out there in the middle of that Baptist church. And the people started showing up to church early. They were having church outside before they went in the church house because they'd got there 30 minutes early. These people were losing their mind. They were going in the church and they were staying until 10 and 11 o'clock. People were crying on the altars and shouting and, and begging church members for, to forgive them because they had hurt one another. They had caused confusion in the church. And when church was finally turned out, they'd go outside and they didn't want to go home. These people just went crazy. They wanted to stay at church. They wanted to fellowship one another. They actually found out they liked one another. That's hard to believe for me. I, you know, golly gee. But they actually got to know what the Spirit was doing, and they liked it. Well, Mr. Religion is always around where the Spirit's working at. So the elders in the church, the deacons, the religious sect, the old guys like me, got together, and they decided they needed to straighten that place out. It was just getting too wild. 
So they drug out on Wednesday nights their tenants of faith, and they taught 12 weeks on Wednesday night in the Bible study on the tenets of faith of the church. This is what we believe, and this is what our denomination is established on, and this is what we're going to go by. Well, you go out there now, 15, 30 minutes late, get in the church, 8 o'clock, 8.15, everybody's outside, and they're in a car, and they're gone. Every time the Holy Spirit starts working, the devil shows up. And if you're not rooted and grounded and have authority enough in the Spirit to take control of what's going on and loose the Spirit in your life and in your church, you wind up the same way. And I'm talking to the people out there today that's sitting in churches. They're sitting in their house out of churches because they have been done the same way. Let me tell you, a lot of you people, every time you walk into the church house, you know you're a sinner. And I'm going to tell you why you're a sinner, and you don't even know why you're a sinner. A lot of people walk into a church house, and over there on the wall is this plaque that's about yay big and yay big, and it has covenant written right on it and hanging on the wall. When you joined that church and became a member of that church, you were bound by your membership and your acceptance in that church to believe what that covenant said. You are bound by your membership and the right hand of fellowship or the baptism into that church that you are bound by the bylaws, the mission statements of that church. And over there in that covenant, it says you will support in tithes and offerings and love your fellow brethren in that church and you will lift them up and you will love them and you not backbite against them and all this stuff. So just by the covenant over there on the wall, not counting the ordinances of your church, the government rules of your church, just by the covenant hanging on the wall, you became a vow breaker. You became a covenant breaker because... Most of you haven't even read that covenant, so you don't know what you're breaking. You don't know what you're bound to by accepting membership in that church. So you walk in there and sit down, and you're automatically, by being a member of that church, according to the Old Testament laws, according to the teachings of Christ, because Christ said it's better that you should never make a vow than to break a vow by accepting a membership in that church. You agreed to that covenant. You made a vow, and you broke it. And you break it every Sunday and every Wednesday, and you're even unaware. So 90% of the people sitting in that church are covenant breakers, and they don't know why the power of God won't move. Sorry, I didn't write the book. I didn't prepare the message. The Holy Spirit did. But I'm here with good news. You're not condemned if you're a Christian. You're walking in forgiveness. Except Christ and His promises are sure and true and His blood covered a multitude of sin. Yes. I'm not up here condemning any denomination. I'm not up here condemning anyone that's in any denomination. We have family members in different denominations. Yeah. Some family members that are in non-denominational. Uh -huh. We are associating fellowship with many denominations. And I wound up teaching that controversial Bible study and finished up the book of Acts for four years. The most controversial church member, the most controversial person in the room, they wound up running off the guy that actually started the Bible study and he left the country and went to Washington, D.C., of all places. And whenever it come down and they didn't have a teacher, guess who they looked at? Guess who they appointed? The most controversial man in the whole clique. Me, I taught the book of Acts for four solid years before we finished. And then while I was teaching the book of Acts, I had a man come in from out of state from down Nashville. Poor old Presbyterian boy. He was the next controversial person in that Bible study. And I knew, as Rick was saying today, he wasn't supposed to do something, and he knew it. Well, I knew my time in the Bible study as being leadership of the Bible study was over. I wasn't to leave the Bible study, but my time of fulfilling the teacher was over. And I was praying about, well, God, what is, who do you want me to, to, to put in in my place? Because you're moving me out. He said, I want you to put him in. And the man, you know, that old country bumpkin, huh? You know, he's that was controversial as I was on a lot of his doctrinal agreements. Believe. 
He said, yeah, but you know what I'm going to do? He said, while he teaches this Bible study, I'm going to teach him my word because he will not teach this Bible study until he covers this word, till he gets in this word and he searches it out and he prays and he seeks every week before he comes to this Bible study. And while he's doing all that and suffering all this persecution for what he believes, he said, I'm going to teach him faith and I'm going to put my word in him and I'm going to bring it to life in him. That man here now is still teaching that Monday night Bible study, that poor old Presbyterian boy. And stuff I have heard come out of his mouth over the past 20 plus years is amazing. His confession this year the other day, Brother Tom, I am a firm believer that we should be able to see the things in the Spirit more frequently and more abundantly than we see with our own natural eyes. Poor old Presbyterian boy. Oh, they just don't really believe that. And their main denominations have gone like a lot of other main denominations. They have embraced evil and accepted it in their church. But God is working and faithful with everyone that seeks him. And I'm again, I'm not condemning you. What the world needs is Jesus is not condemning you. You want to go to Job and argue with me? There's a verse there in Job says, There is a spirit within man that, gives, that is from God that gives him his own opinion. It doesn't mean it's right, but I am entitled to my own opinion, and you are entitled to your own opinion, right or wrong. So, you know, don't bother to tweet the nasty letters. Don't bother to Facebook to time, waste your time because there's that old trash button. Click in the trash can, it goes. Not worth a response. This argument was, is between you and the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. And I can tell you right now, you're losing. Before you even start it, you've already lost. But it's for your redemption your exhortation and your exaltation in the body of Christ. It's time we put the body of Christ back in order and walked in unity, as Paul says over there in Corinthians, that we've done throw it in the trash as a whole body of Christ and Christ being the head. Let of the Spirit, not taking up the lusts of the flesh in Ephesians, but fulfilling the Spirit. And I'm closing with that today, and I hope it's blessed you. I hope it's set you free. I hope, most of all, it's got you saved if you're one of those wolves in sheep's clothing that's creeped into the church and trying to cause confusion and derision and all this stuff, division. I hope you get saved because I want to see. You know, I have some friends that believe in universalism where all mankind will be saved. I hope to God that they are absolutely right. Because the Word of God says God is not willing that any, any should perish but come to the knowledge of Christ. And that's my hope for you. I'm not condemning you. I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm telling you there's a lot more that we need to know. And a lot of what we already know has been traditionally handed down by carnal-minded men misunderstanding the Word of God. And I embrace different denominations, and different believers, Jesus Christ, Church of Christ. You know, the list goes on and on. The poor old uh, brother there that's teaching the Bible study. <laughs> Presbyterian. But once you come to the foundation and knowledge that it's not yours that you hinge on, it's Christ the leading of the Spirit that you hinge on, that you can love one another irregardless of your differences. And that's one thing we have come to in that Bible study over these years. We still disagree. But we come together every week knowing where we disagree, and we still study the Word and search for truth and get up leaving, loving one another, and we've come to be just like that. You know, one depends on the other, irregardless of the difference, the unity of the Word of God and the unity of the Spirit of God that dwells within us makes us unified to trust one another. 
We trust one another with intimate prayers that we won't release to anybody else. We trust one another to pray for each other for things that we won't tell anybody else because we know that we are faithful to the Word and faithful to the Spirit that we can love one another in the unity of the bond of Christ. And that's where the body of Christ needs to get to. And this is the answer to that question. Why are there so many differences in the body of Christ? Get closer to God. Learn more scripture. Quit taking my word or some other preacher's word, but get in touch with the Holy Spirit. And that was the first thing that God showed me when he delivered me from religion, confusion, demonic spirits, and everything else. He said, son... Get in my word and read it. And if you don't know anything, don't you ask anybody but me. And I'll give you the answer. Don't you go. We always run to some other man. We always run to a commentary. We always run to somebody's opinion. And the last place we want to go to find the truth, and when we can't find it anywhere else, is I guess I'll just have to ask God. And that should be the first place that we go, not the last place that we go. So I've been on here long enough, and I'm closing now, and this is the only closing I'm going to use, so here it is. For prayer requests that what the world needs is Jesus, you can private message facebook.com forward slash what the world needs is Jesus. You can call or text Brother Ricky Phillips, 256-630-1262. Brother Larry Moss, 256-603-0641. Brother Kenneth Crane, 256-557-2858. Brother Harold O'Neill, 256-475-5854. What the world needs at G is Jesus at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and remember the disclaimer that I put out at the beginning of the program. What the world Jesus needs is Jesus is not responsible for the content preached from this pulpit. It's only an outlet for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got set free. I hope you learned some things. God bless, and till next time, we leave it with you. Thank you. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's like the rhythm of a gospel song.
quiet. Singing in my soul, I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.